Hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar brought to you by the International Pharmaceutical Federation, FIP. Thank you to those joining us live and to those listening in afterwards. I'd also like to warmly welcome our guests today, our young pharmacy heroes, who we will shortly introduce. I'm Dahlia Bajas with an FIP, and alongside my team members, I am a global lead for the Workforce Development Hub on Pharmacist Foundation Training. I am also a member of FIP's Academic Pharmacy Section Executive Committee. Currently an assistant professor at Muhammad al Mana College for Medical Sciences in Saudi Arabia and an affiliate at the University of Sydney Faculty of Medicine and Health in Australia. Our second moderator for this session is Dr. Katie Kika. Katie is a clinical pharmacy specialist practicing at the Veterans Affairs Hospital in Wisconsin in the United States in primary care and anticoagulation. Hello, Katie. I know it's very early for you at this time of day. It's just probably past seven o'clock in the morning. She serves as a preceptor to student pharmacists and residents at her hospital. Katie is also the Young Pharmacist Group Liaison to Academic Pharmacy Section. Welcome to you, Katie. FIP is the global body representing over 4 million pharmacists and pharmaceutical scientists. FIP's vision is a world where everyone benefits from access to safe, effective, quality and affordable medicines and health technologies. Our mission is to support global health by enabling the advancement of pharmaceutical practice, sciences and education. We are pleased to be delivering this event, the 14th episode in the Responding to the Pandemic Together series. This is a special Hearing from Our Heroes episode. We know that the world's pharmacy team is fighting COVID-19 everywhere, working closely with other healthcare workers and often putting their lives at risk to protect and care for patients and the public during these challenging times. So, as part of this online program provided by FIP, we will be featuring regular Hearing From Our Heroes webcasts, where we talk to pharmacy heroes from different countries, learn about their experiences, and share those stories with you. Today, we will learn about pharmacy students and young pharmacists' experiences working in different countries during COVID-19 pandemic and together with you, discuss some of the challenges and possible solutions faced by our young pharmacy heroes working on the front line. Please note, this event will be recorded, live streamed on FIP's Facebook profile, and we will be freely available. To all those listening, please feel free to send your questions through the questions box, and we will endeavor to pick those up uh, throughout the day session. I am now pleased to be introducing three of our panelists from the Eastern Mediterranean region. And for the first time, from the occupied Palestinian territory, we have Anas Najjar. Welcome, Anas. Nice to have you on the call. Hello. Anas Good is a community here. pharmacist with a master's degree in pharmaceutical scientist, sciences from Al Quds University in Palestine. Working in Ramallah and managing another pharmacy in Jerusalem, Anas was one of many first-line responders during COVID-19 who were granted special permits by Palestinian and Israeli officials categorized as critical healthcare workers. Welcome, Anas, again. Hearing from Bahrain, and also for the first time too, are actually two of my ex-students from the University of Bahrain, who we are so proud to have on the show. Um, Abrar Husseini and Hello. Sara Aisa, both recent pharmacy graduates from the University of Bahrain pharmacy program. Abrar is currently a volunteer pharmacist at one of the COVID-19 quarantine facilities in Bahrain, helping in supplying medicines to patients and managing drug stocks. Sara is also a volunteer pharmacist 
at Bahrain Exhibition Center for testing coronavirus and is responsible for performing nasopharyngeal swaps and supporting the Bahraini Kingdom's public awareness campaign to combat COVID-19. I will now hand over to the lovely Katie, who will continue to introduce our panelists. Thank you, Katie, and over to you. Thank you, Dahlia. So I will be introducing our final three panelists. I'd like to introduce first Mercy Kamya. She is uh, audio only right now due to internet connectivity uh, issues. Uh, Mercy is a hospital pharmacist from Uganda. She works at the International Hospital Kampala. She has provided training and support in compounding projects during the COVID-19 pandemic. She has formerly served as the chairperson of the 8th IPSF African Pharmaceutical Symposium, as well as contributed to various projects, both locally and internationally. She is also currently a member of the FIP Young Pharmacist Group Professional Development Team. Welcome, Mercy. I'd next like to introduce Sunil Shrefta. Dr. Sunil is a clinical researcher and registered pharmacist who works as a clinical pharmacist and research associate at Nepal Cancer Center, Nepal Cancer Hospital and Research Center. He is a founder of the Nepal Health Research and Innovation Foundation, where he is working in areas of pharmacovigilance, pharmacoeconomics, medication safety, and patient education. Sunil is also visiting faculty in pharmacy colleges in Nepal. Welcome, Sunil. Thank you, Katie. And then our final panelist that I would like to introduce is Ramon Contrucci from the Netherlands. Ramon graduated last summer as a pharmacist in the city of Utrecht, the Netherlands. He works in the Dietz Klander Hospital at the Clinical Pharmacy Department. Within this department, he is involved in the management <clears throat> of the COVID-19 outbreak. He reached out to the student community to help during this crisis and also helped coordinate their working activities. Welcome, Ramon. Thank you. So now, after we have uh, introduced all of our six lovely panelists who've joined us today, we will now be starting our large group panelist discussion. We have about three questions that we will go through. And then if you have any specific questions for each individual panelist or for the large group, please use the chat box through Zoom to ask your questions as well. So our first question for our panelist group is that we would like each individual panelist to give a brief overview of their current working experience during the COVID-19 pandemic. And we will start off with Ramon. All right. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, I think one, thing's, uh, one thing we do as a hospital pharmacy is uh, supporting, uh, mainly supporting our, de our departments, which are closer to the COVID uh, patients and uh, the COVID suspected patients. Uh, so one thing we wanted to do as, um, as the, the hospital pharmacy, um, we wanted to uh, prepare uh, IV medication for the uh, intensive care unit uh, in specific. So uh, basically um, in a normal situation, the nurses themselves make uh, a lot of IV medication and prepare uh, like uh, the dissolving files, uh, etc. Um, so we thought if we could, can take that out of the hands of, from the nurses, uh, they would have more time to uh, to help the COVID uh, patients, and as you just uh, told in the introduction, um, uh, I, yeah, I, I managed to reach out to uh, pharmacy students uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, actually, the the pharmacy association, um, students, the study association, um, made an, on on internet made a platform to connect students who wanted to help. Um, with um, hospitals or other institutions who needed some help. Um, so through that platform, we um, got in touch uh, with five pharmacy students, actually within a day. Um, and after that, um, yeah, there were, we gave them a short training to make, uh, how to make the, the IV medication. We mainly uh, focused on the, um, the medicines which were frequently used and also uh, easy to, um, administer in fixed dose so we could prepare a lot. Um, 
yeah, so after that, we, uh, we instructed the students and um, yeah, they, they made all kinds of uh, intravenous uh, medicines for the, for the intensive care unit. It, it, it was about uh, 15, 15 administrations a day for each patient. Uh, in total, we had like yeah, around 30 uh, intensive care beds. So yeah, that, that's between three and 400 uh, preparations each day, which were made by the students on the supervision of one of the, one of the uh, more experienced uh, pharmacy uh, assistants. And eventually it was uh, cleared by, by a pharmacist, of course. Um, and another thing I was involved in was uh, the, um, uh, the implementation of electronic uh, prescriptions. So instead of uh, paper prescriptions, we uh, managed to uh, implement um, uh, electronic prescriptions, which were sent directly to the um, uh, community pharmacies from our system to the to their system. So I think in a in a in a yeah, in a summary, that's about uh, what I uh, was mainly focused on during the pandemic. Great, thank you for your response. We'll next move to Anis to share his experience with uh, COVID nineteen. Okay. Well, uh, during this. Uh rough uh, period that we all experienced i was divided between uh, ramallah and uh, jerusalem um, and also the outskirts of jerusalem uh, i was uh, working mainly as a community pharmacist at the uh, at the uh, at the pharmacy and uh, i was also uh, managing a uh, a pharmacy branch in uh, Jerusalem. Um, basically, uh, we also, um, uh, to echo what uh, Ramon uh, mentioned about the, the digital prescriptions, we dropped every uh, kind of uh, paperwork that was used uh, uh, for the favor of, of uh, digital prescriptions. Um, uh, we also dealt with a huge number of patients uh, seeing up to 600 patients in a normal working day that would be from 8 a.m. to around uh, 10 p.m. Uh, so um, the we also we would the pharmacy teams all around the country were also stretched out so we were called to help uh, around the the country uh, uh, at times in uh, uh, the northern part of the country, uh, uh, like uh, like Tel Aviv, and uh, at times in uh, places like in Nablus and Jenin in the occupied Palestinian territories, um, um, the experience uh, stretched out the entire uh, medical uh, workforce uh, as well as pharmacists, especially pharmacists, to their limits. Uh, we ended up working. Um, 10 shift weeks and uh, 12 shift weeks at times uh, to in order to uh, cope with the increased demands for uh, medications uh, especially with uh, uh, certain uh, patients trying to stockpile medications out of the uh, panic that uh, followed once the seriousness of the situation set in uh, so basically, that was it. Um, we we worked under under uh, immense pressure uh, in order to um, keep up with the demand and the shortages of the medications, as well as the increased number of patients uh, that we saw uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. It's it's interesting that um, to, listening to both Ramon and, and yourself, Anas, um, and. Um, you know, you, you sound so cool about it now that, you know, that was it. But in actual fact, you're both echoing uh, the pressure that you felt, obviously, uh, uh, as, the, as the coronavirus became a, a pandemic or declared a pandemic. And that must have been quite stressful, obviously, for you. And I've just reflected on some of the things that Ramon have said um, about um, the involvement of pharmacy students. Uh, I really appreciate that. I, I love that, the fact that you're obviously also harnessing the role of students um, uh, in, in, in carrying out some of these, uh, um, you know, duties to help you cope. And I also, uh, you know, love your explanation, how you reached out to the nursing, uh, um, you know, 
colleagues and, and, and collaborated with them on that. So thank you for that. I think in reflection just shows uh, the immensity of um, the, the workload that you had to obviously be, be, be carrying out during these times. Yeah. And now we'll move on to our third panelist, Abrar. Hello. Um, so I've been volunteering at a quarantine facility in an industrial part of Bahrain. Um, but since there is new guidelines and new protocols coming in day by day, um, a lot has changed since the beginning of my volunteer period till now. At the beginning, it was just a quarantine facility for um, people who've been like abroad and they just came back to Bahrain. And whoever was tested to be negative, they would be placed inside the quarantine facility for two weeks where they would be retested by the end and like you know we'd separate the positive cases and the contacts um so we'd be responsible to provide them their chronic medication or any other medication they'd be needing uh in the beginning of that period in that period like mostly we we'd be contacting uh, since it was we didn't really actually have a pharmacy the first thing we just had a cartoon box with some prescriptions we picked up from one of the health centers it was our job to like kind of create a pharmacy for the facility at first it was just chronic medication like metformin um other like oral hypoglycemics or antihypertensives but as the as all flights came back to bahrain and the quarantine cases were limited to like the protocols changed to let them just have be at home quarantine. The center was changed to an isolation center instead for positive cases. And we'd have to change, we were, we had to change a lot of the medication we're receiving. And that's kind of where we had a struggle, especially since now we have to order cough syrups and like things to treat the symptoms. And through this, like during this process, we also had to change the, our source of medication. First, it used to be health centers. Now we'd be contacting one of the university hospitals in the region. It was mm -hmm. like, um, we mostly dealt with managing the stocks provided and we'd also help the doctors who had some difficulty in prescribing prescriptions, especially with patients with comorbidities. Wow, there's a lot there and um, I think I probably could summarize what you've just described, Abrar, um, by the uh, adaptability that you as um, recent graduates, actually, you've only been out for about six months or so, um, having to obviously work yeah. uh, alongside your colleague pharmacists and actually adapt to the evolving nature of, of this pandemic. So well done to you. That's great. Thank Lovely you. Lovely to hear. We'll now uh, hand it off to Sarah to share her experience. Uh, hello, everyone. So uh, my volunteering site in Bahrain um, is the Bahrain Exhibition Center, which is the main center uh, responsible for the uh, COVID-19 testing. Um, yeah, I work. Uh, I worked uh, with a team of registered uh, nurses and physician, and uh, I am the only pharmacist there. And um, we are responsible for doing the nasopharyngeal swabs um, uh, to combat virus corona. Uh, and uh, uh, after doing the nasopharyngeal swab, um, uh, we enter all the patient's data. Um, in the corona visit sheet uh, and then we send the samples to the lab um, and we are responsible uh, to perform 3,000 up to 6,000 swabs per day including um, uh, random screening, uh, first swab, pre-exit swab and I am currently uh, volunteering in the main drugstore in Bahrain uh, where we ensure all the medical supplies uh, arrive to the health centers as well as the governmental hospital urgently. Sarah, how many staff members are working along uh, your side with the swaps? You said you do about 6,000 a day, is that correct? Just yeah. at the exhibition center? Yeah. 
there is uh, basically uh, there is two holes there uh, one responsible for uh, the nasopharyngeal swap for the passengers and the other one uh, for the uh, uh, for making the random screening also there is uh, the drive through uh, tents uh, so um, we are working um, uh, of a team uh, consists of um, 70 physicians and um, nurses to be very proud of yourself Sarah being the only pharmacist there well done thank you We'll now close off our first question with Sunil. Uh, there always, uh, all these states of the pandemic, uh, there was a significant increase in demand for medicine, uh, indigent medicine, uh, which was uh, such as uh, panic buying uh, of over-the-counter drugs. Uh, such as um, paracetamol, uh, paracetamol, ibuprofen. So there was a, um, a artificial shortage due to the over stocking and the over purchasing uh, by the consumers, which uh, led uh, to um, artificial shortage and high in the price. So there was uh, uh, so we uh, coordinated with uh, manufacturers distributors to ensure and that adequate supplies, storage and uh, transport of the um, formula medicine, essential medicine. We did a VED analysis uh, for rational stocking of the drugs. In the shortage of the surgical marks, uh, we, uh, we, we used the five layer growth marks as an alternative. So we, uh, we also had a frequent queries in a drug information center uh, like uh, hydroxychloroquine, ivermectin. So those would take BCG uh, vaccine, are immune to this disease, uh, and so on. So we try to address the queries of the patient uh, public and looking uh, after the patient counseling. So our pharmacy team uh, and our hospital has also implemented a uh, um, various system to protect our staff by keeping uh, bars using uh, using plastic in the pharmacy window, keeping the hand sanitizer at the entrance of the pharmacy and the dispensing bags. Uh, regardless of this, we also encourage customers to use uh, payment by electronic medium to. Um, we have also developed. Uh, we have also developed and solved the COVID guideline uh, for pharmacists and pharmacists assistant, which was especially designed for pharmacy professional, Nepal Pharmaceutical Association. Uh, I think we're having a bit of an uh, issue so hearing you, Sunil, maybe. Distributed and to all, all our staff. Sorry. Thank you, Sunil. I think I, I struggled to hear you a little bit kind of towards the end. But I think we, we got most of what um, okay. what you said. I hope that that was clear to our attendees. Um, I believe that you've described um, the diverse uh, um, um, tasks that you're actually okay. involved okay. in. Um, and especially with the drug information services, is that correct? Yes, I think maybe we're having a bit of a struggle hearing you, Sunil, or maybe you're struggling to hear me, but that's okay. That, that's, that's okay, we'll try and work on that, but we will move on to our last okay. panelist, Katie. And our final panelist that will have share her experience with COVID-19 is Mercy. Hello, Mercy. Thank you. Hello. Yes. Thank you, Katie. So at the time that I started to volunteer at the hospital, the pandemic broke out. And in my country, we had 12 functional intensive care units. And of all of these, there were only 55 beds for the whole country. So our, big, our biggest concern 
was in areas of infection prevention. So most of my work has been in that area. I've also been um, involved in supply chain. Supply chain, uh, we had concerns about shortages of the drugs that were going to come into the country in the hospital because of transportation concerns as well as some countries holding off some of their supplies because most of our drugs, uh, our patients rely on generic medicines. So we also had to have, to, we had um, to work on the supply chain. Yes, uh, I've also been very involved in sourcing partnerships because of the challenges we had, we could not really work alone. So we've had to reach out to some non-government organizations We've had to work in certain areas with microbiologists. We've worked with the Uganda Industrial Research Institute and mostly that has been in helping us source locally available um, substitutes for some of the things that we have been importing, especially in the sector of infection pre prevention. Yes, I have also been um, doing a lot of capacity building and trying to train a lot of my colleagues on how to prepare some of the formulations. Uh, we've helped set up compounding units for the hospital I was working in as well as the society. And these are just trying to bridge the gap about the growing need for um, the sanitizer gels the, and a lot of the things that were being needed in infection prevention because that was the only where we're going to be able to um, halt the pandemic for our country before it became too overwhelming for us. Yes. That's fascinating. I just find it quite fascinating hearing what is happening around the world with you young pharmacists. Um, and I think, um, I think it's ideal for me to maybe ask you, Mercy, then maybe to share some of the challenges. I mean, you've kind of touched on that, but maybe, how would you summarize, uh, you know, the, the, the main challenges that you you faced as as um, a young pharmacist, baby, or maybe in the in the profession during the pandemic? All right, um, I think the the biggest challenge is we are supposed to be young pharmacists that are looking up to mentors and guidance, but this pandemic has hit everyone headstrong, so everyone is learning on the job, even our seniors. So I think my biggest challenge has been equipping myself with information that can actually support the patients that I'm working for in a very short time. Yes, as fast as possible. Another challenge has been uh, when we are looking at infection prevention, which is my biggest concern, is that we have people that uh, in my country, there's a lot of communal um, sourcing of water. So initially, even uh, the channels through which people were getting the normal water was really not safe. So we've had to come up with, a, we've had a major challenge in that area, infection prevention, especially in the area of water being unavailable. Yeah, thank you. That's fascinating. That is really fascinating. And it's, it's talking about rising up to the occasion swiftly, um, you know, considering the circumstances and having to upskill very, very quickly. Um, it's like when, you know, Sarah was sharing that she has to be involved in the nasopharyngeal swabs and then obviously she had to be upskilled for to, to conduct such a task and rise up to the occasion. And so it's just fascinating here listening to you all. Um, thank you for that, Mercy. I might jump to Anas actually from the occupied Palestinian territories and Anas I'm sure that you would have probably faced, um, you know, similar or maybe different uh, set of challenges uh, in, in the rise of the pandemic. Um, yeah, indeed. I mean, um, uh, the situation in Palestine is uh, one that is unique to it. Uh, speaking uh, from uh, a logistic, logistic, uh, logistics point of view and a political point of view. Uh, at the beginning, uh, freedom of movement, movement across the occupied Palestinian territories and um, 
the Israeli side uh, was still available, so we could uh, make trips uh, from uh, the pharmacies in, uh, I would make the trip from the pharmacy in, in Rwanda and the pharmacy is inside easily. Uh, but as the serious, as the pandemic raged on and uh, more cases were uh, uh, being reported, um, the, the movement was uh, cut off uh, almost completely um, uh, across um, the, the border uh, between the two uh, territories. Uh, so, um, in terms of uh, permissions, we I had to do, uh, uh, get a special uh, permits um, that um, uh, uh, provide me with the title of critical worker, um, critical health worker, uh, which meant that I could uh, um, easily uh, make the trip between the two sides um uh with um with at all times of the day um whilst um certain teams were um uh, subjected to curfews at night and uh, were not allowed to uh, return or leave the uh, palestinian territories uh, uh most of the time um also um some medications were uh um, being um, we're starting to run out in the uh, Ramallah side, so uh, we uh, made sure that uh, to the extent that uh, we could, uh, we provided the pharmacies there with as much support as uh, we could. Um, as you know, not everybody can make the trip across uh, to both sides. But um, living in Jerusalem, I can I can do that, and I can move across the across the two territories. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is the uh, this is one of the unique challenges that I faced uh, living in Jerusalem. And as to give uh, to give listeners a perspective, how long does it take you to commute from the West Bank into your work in Jerusalem on daily basis? Um. On a daily basis, if uh, if you uh, are caught up in the checkpoint traffic, it would take you uh, anything between uh, an hour and two and a half hours uh, um, to uh, reach um, the uh, the Jerusalem side. Uh, but uh, if you leave uh, early, it would take you the uh, normal uh, twenty twenty five minutes. So uh, yeah. it, it's anything from three to five-fold. Yeah. Wow. So obviously you have to, you know, bear in mind your, your commuting uh, time on daily basis, taking that into account as you're moving from one site to the next. So there's a lot of work there as well, Anas. I uh, appreciate you sharing those challenges with us, Anas. Um, thank you for that. Moving on to uh, Ramon. Uh, summarizing some of the challenges that you have been facing professionally or even on a prof on a on a personal uh, kind of level coping with with the pandemic yeah the microphone um, is yours yeah when when, when uh, i think the the one of the advantages we had in the netherlands is that um yeah the outbreak uh, came a little bit uh, later than some other countries so you already had some um a time to prepare so in, in, in that sense, I think we were kind of uh, lucky. But um, yeah, uh, one of the challenges for me personally, where I've been working on was, um, as I mentioned before, the, 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 the uh, e-prescriptions with, with um, so we got a lot of complaints from the community pharmacists uh, about the, the, the paper um, prescriptions and the risk of uh, contaminating um, everyone through those uh, papers. Uh, and actually it was a project I was already working on to get rid of all the papers and um, it was quite hard to convince all the all the physicians and the doctors to actually use it. It's, I think it, it, it might be a common, uh, a common thing in other countries as well. But um, then Corona came and uh, actually even the, the, the oldest ones were willing to, uh, to uh, make use of, of, of the function to electronically send these, uh, these things. 
So that was you know, maybe a small challenge when you compare it to, uh, for example, the water problem Mercy just uh, mentioned. Mm -hmm. And I think more on, on a, a little bit uh, larger scale, one of the challenges was um, uh, on information transfer since the outbreak um, uh, started in, in, in certain regions. Uh, so uh, patients were uh, transferred to other hospitals where it was less busy. Um, and one of the challenges was that uh, the information, the sort of medical information, the inf information about medication, um, went lost some, somewhere along the way. So there was a national um, a platform was built by uh, Philips, the company Philips, uh, and support to, uh, yeah, to, to, to transfer all the medical information in a really uh, easy way. Uh, so that was uh, very nice. And uh, with regards to uh, shortage of medicine, um, which also was a problem in the Netherlands. We uh, mm -hmm. actually centralized uh, that in a national committee who uh, looked at uh, how, how can we make sure we have enough uh, to uh, treat all, uh, all our patients. That's, that's um, you know, interesting to hear from you, Ramon. And, and when you were talking about information and managing information, one of the things that came to mind was um, did you have to deal with a lot of misinformation and fake news with, with patients? Um, and how, how did you deal with that at all? No, I mean, I'm putting on the spot here, but did you have to deal with anything like that? Uh, no, not, not necessarily misinformation, information, I think, but uh, with regards to the, to, the, to the medicines, I think uh, we, yeah, we did miss a lot of information. And in one hospital, they might have used... Uh, uh, another uh, antibiotics so we try to have one uh, guideline uh, with regards to the to the treatment of uh, of corona but um, yeah there were some uh, some small differences between hospitals so uh, yeah sometimes you also had a reaction like oh, in this hospital i got mm. uh, got ceftriaxone uh, and now i'm getting uh, yeah. something else um, so yeah, it, it, it really helped to, to get all the information uh, from the other hospitals. In, uh, those it's important to collaborate, I guess, to yeah. even with information exchange as well, that will ultimately benefit our patients, of course. Thank yeah. you for that, Ramon. Thank you. Appreciate it. I'm going around the, 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 the panelists here. I mean, Katie, you're next. You're a hospital pharmacist too. You probably could share some of your challenges, but I'll skip you <laughs> and I'll go straight to um, Sunil to share some of the challenges that you faced in the workplace, Sunil, in Nepal. Uh, like uh, Ramon said, there, there is uh, misinformation, false information, uh, which is uh, very challenging to solve. Uh, so this is the one challenge. Another challenge is, is, is uh, there are only few hospitals which uh, Prioritize the pharmaceutical care, which uh, focuses on clinical pharmacies. But the majority of uh, hospitals doesn't uh, uh, provide the pharmaceutical care. Drug, uh, drug information centers are lacking. It is uh, really difficult to manage um, adequate uh, medication. So there is a poor security to help professional. So there is also a lack of appropriate pharmacy education on disaster mm. and infectious disease. The, uh, pharmacists uh, are skilled, but not that much skilled to, uh, to, to prepare for this kind of disaster or any infectious disease. So um, I think the one professional guideline is required. Um, uh, required. So that's it. Thank you so much for that. I'm um, um, really appreciating as well that we have a few questions, um, Katie, on Q&A um, that I think we could probably try and weave in as um, even Sarah and Abrar can talk about some of the challenges and some of the questions that are coming through um, are in, in particular to young pharmacists. What kind of training did you receive to be at the front line, Abrar and Sarah? If you can think about that for a moment. Um, to obviously uh, upskill um, and what do you think uh, could be done more about about your training perhaps or some of the questions I'm just having a look down at those um, if you'd like to mention them so I'll go I'll go to sure. Abrar first and then we'll move on to Sarah. Uh, regarding the question or the challenges I think yeah yeah you can talk about both or either. <laughs> okay I'll answer the question first um, regarding like if I've received actual like um, training or upskill 
uh, to be upskilled in order to volunteer, I actually didn't receive any. But as a research pharmacy graduate, I have had um, field practice. I have like trained in pharmacies and that's the only thing that's helped me in volunteering. Um, I was briefly trained on how to do nasopharyngeal swabs, but not enough to perform them myself. But I have been trained on the administrative work. So when there is a shortage in staff that are working in the administrative side of the center, I step up and like I help make all the lists and the admissions. And we've also helped doing uh, and discharging patients from the facility. Um, as for some of the struggles I've faced, um, I've only graduated four months ago, so I don't really have any official work experience. And it was a struggle to start up a pharmacy all by myself. I have uh, trained, I have experience in preparing and dispensing prescriptions. I have experience in uh, drug interactions and like the basic stuff, but it was difficult in managing stocks and kind of creating something out of nothing. It was also difficult to communicate with a lot of the patients because at one point we like it was the center like after the travelers have finished like they were all discharged from the center we had a lot of expatriate workers and there was a huge language barrier since a lot of them couldn't speak neither arabic nor english they would uh, speak urdu but thankfully i knew a few words here and there and it was it was a struggle but we managed to get like to help them out and manage things with, between them. Wow, that's fascinating, having to rise up to the occasion like that abroad. But you know what? That's what you do. You, you learn on the job as well. Uh, and that's what you have done. You should be very, very proud of yourself for doing that and participating in this, which is fantastic. Um, Sarah, was that similar to you as well? Yeah, I totally agreed with Abrar about the language barrier. Um, but I think uh, through my experience in Bahrain Exhibition Center, the biggest uh, challenge we are facing today is the lack of commitment by some people in the society um, to the, all the instruction given by the Ministry of Health. I think today we should be um, one hand, we should be aware and we should be responsible. We should follow all the instruction given by the Ministry of Health uh, in order to reduce the risk of transmission of this virus. Yes, 100%. The, the public also have, has a role to play here by adhering yeah. to, to the advice that has been passed on to them from official uh, bodies, 100%, Sarah, and that will make your job and the job of other healthcare professionals um, easier because people are adhering to these instructions, isn't it? Yeah. And um, 100%. People in the, in the Q&A uh, chat box, um, we have a question and maybe this question can maybe go to uh, some of the other panelists. Um, you know, what, what do you think pharmacists should do to get more recognition for what they do? Um, and I'm not sure if anybody in the panel would like to, to maybe comment on that. Yeah, sure. Thanks, um, well, I, I, I think one of the things you can do as a pharmacist is um, take responsibility and, and act uh, in front. So, for example, um, what we also do uh, with the pharmacists here in the hospital is um, to take part in uh, multidisciplinary um, uh, meetings with, uh, with the doctors and with uh, the, the antibiotic stewardship and with, with different uh, healthcare professionals. And that way you can really... Um, yeah, I think can really make a difference um, since yeah you are the expert on uh, medicines, which can be uh, really uh, useful in uh, in these times. And sometimes you um, yeah you, you you can give uh, give give like doctors and everyone involved uh, a, a total totally different perspective, which can uh, can help. I think the key is to, to communicate and to uh, to share as much information as you can uh, within. Uh, your own profession, like the, between in between pharmacists, but uh, also uh, between other uh, healthcare uh, professionals, and I think that's also a very good way to um, show your value as a, as a pharmacist to to, to the outside uh, world. That's great, Ramon. Communication is key. I think no one can disagree with that. 
hundred percent. I don't know if Mercy or Anas um, would like to make a comment about, um, you know, getting more recognition for the pharmacist role um, in your own uh, hometown. Is this something that you'd like to comment on? Um, sure. Yes, I think I would really confer with Ramon. Taking responsibility is so crucial, as well as um, learning to work on other teams. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, when we set out to look at infection prevention, ideally the pharmacist would not be taking a lead role in that. But because we sat down on a table and interacted with different um, healthcare professionals, um, we were led to actually see that it's a very possible thing. Uh, I think I've also highlighted, we ended up writing a proposal on how to use um, very local, uh, very cheap materials, like let's say sorghum, it's a desert plant. And as we were doing that, people were recognizing, okay, a pharmacist can find, uh, they can find uh, something that is chemically it in a formulation. Uh, so they appreciated our knowledge because previously they did not. Secondly, we got to have their their input because we realized there are people who have maybe done microbiology and this is something that they have better expertise in. So when we work with others, when we take responsibility, it helps us a great deal. And the more people can relate with you, the more they're willing to call you to the table and be part of the process. Thank you. That's amazing, Mercy. Just listening to all of you, I think I want to work with all of you now. You're just all so inspiring and dedicated. Katie, I'm going to hand over to you for, um, you know, our kind of second last question, if I, if I may. Yes, Thank you. Course. So uh, just being mindful of the time that we have left for our webinar, we have um, a kind of summary final question for our panelists regarding um, if they could each share one lesson that they've learned throughout this pandemic, uh, personally, professionally related to their work with COVID patients or with um, managing kind of the result of being involved in a pandemic. So we'll have, we'll go around again um, and we'll keep it uh, just one, one lesson learned this time. And then we'll have one more final um, summary closing question for everyone. So let's start off with uh, Ramon. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, well, as I said before, I think one of the, the most important things during a pandemic like this is to communicate and to share each other's knowledge, for example, through these webinars, but also within the hospital, uh, within the region, within the country. Um, and also evaluate uh, everything. So we just, uh, yeah, we, we, we like uh, uh, had, had the first wave of Corona. And now everything is, 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 is settling down a little bit more, but yeah, who knows? Um, uh, yeah, it, it, it's, a pre, it's a probable chance that, the, that there is a second wave in lying ahead in the future. Um, so it's really important to uh, evaluate everything. Uh, what are the lessons learned? Um, uh, what can we do better? And also look at uh, other countries. Uh, what, what, what did they do? Um, in certain, and, and what was the best way um, to get to get by and to get through this uh, this crisis um, as unharmed as possible? Um, so I think that that's that's the main lesson uh, to to keep sharing and to keep um, remembering the lessons you have already learned, so you're better prepared um, the next time when something similar or um, yeah happens. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I think you hit on a lot of key points, especially in the COVID time where everything is changing, or at least initially every single day or every hour, something was different in terms of a new policy or procedure and being able to be very adaptable to those changes and go with the flow and make sure you take those lessons and what you learned early on in the pandemic, you still apply those principles, even if it's a couple months later and things are for now slowing down, making sure that we still keep in mind what we learned from 
from earlier. So no. thank you. So I'll turn it over to Anis to now share his his lesson learned with the group. Um, this pandemic, if it taught me one lesson, if I were to choose one lesson, is uh, the importance of the role of the pharmacist in um, uh, bridging the gap in the knowledge between uh, the medical platforms and the general public. Uh, as well as combating the rumors that people are spreading and uh, are spreading on so social media. Uh, in addition to the uh, the crucial uh, key that we um, perhaps uh, tend to forget or uh, uh, ignore at times uh, the role of the pharmacist in uh, uh, providing uh, sane, sound advice to people at times of uh, hysteria as well as at times of peace. Yes, thank you for that. I'll turn it over to Sara. Um, I learned that we can all play a part um, in, uh, in preventing the spread of the virus. And um, um, I learned that panic will only impede uh, our success in managing the pandemic. Um, we are all working uh, together to flatten uh, the curve of the virus uh, by following all the instruction uh, provided to us, uh, especially social distancing. And I think social distancing cannot be done uh, by half measures. Uh, it should be done by everybody. Yes, thank you, Sarah. We all can play our own part um, as both healthcare workers and, you know, personally outside of work in terms of social distancing and following recommendations. Abrar. Um, I learned that it's very important to give it our all while we're helping out people and while we're doing our job, especially like not only like by doing the textbook definition of our job, it's also very important to be empathetic towards our patients because even if a person is healthy and is okay the, during these troubling times, if the panic ensues, everything goes to everything gets like disrupted. And that doesn't only apply to patients, it also applies to other healthcare professionals. It's, a re, uh, we should be all be hand in hand because if we aren't, it's going to make it more difficult to reach our goal. And Mercy, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, I've learned uh, that it takes one person to spark a change, but it's going to take a community. I think one of the, the attendees has raised the question on the fact that some communities are not really uh, taking cushion on the social, distance, social distancing measures. And I think teamwork is important. COVID-19 has shown us that even if you do the right thing, if you do not assist your neighbor in doing that, then we are all going to fall together. Thank you. Yes, I definitely, definitely agree. We're all, we're all managing this pandemic together as pharmacists and personally, and being able to, to come together and provide support for, for everyone and our neighbors and family and friends is also very important. And to close it out, I'll turn it over to Sunil. So there are some lessons that we learned from the pandemic, both in near and long term. And we are still learning from this unique experience, experience uh, such as uh, expanding pharmacy delivery services, uh, merging pharmacy services with technology. We can uh, expand the um, pharmacy services with uh, services like telehealth, telemedicine services. These are the things uh, which I learned uh, from this pandemic. 
Great. So, well, thank you very much uh, for everyone sharing your uh, very thoughtful lessons learned throughout this pandemic. And I will turn it over to my co-moderator, Dahlia, for, our, for leading our final question here. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, everyone. Um, definitely uh, very moving uh, lessons there that we can all share. Um, being mindful of the time, but I'm sure we'll be okay for an extra minute to keep up the tradition of concluding FIP webinars with one last quick question to everyone. In one sentence message, um, what would you like to say to the pharmacy workforce around the world? A message during these difficult times, a message of solidarity to all of our colleagues around the world, but particularly maybe in response to this particular webinar to our young heroes. So let's start off with a one sentence from each one of you with maybe Ramon. Would that be okay? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Actually, I came up with a lot of uh, cliches. <laughs> then I thought, <laughs> yeah, I say, don't get sick, but that was also. No, so now, but um, I think the, um, yeah, the, the most important thing or the message is anticipate and uh, learn from, from the, what happens and uh, take your lessons and evaluate and uh, take responsibility because um, although it's a hard time, uh, I think it's also uh, a time uh, where we can learn a lot and also can show uh, the value of the pharmacist um, and we should um, yeah, anticipate to that as well and we should, we should um, continue our work and continue to be involved in, um, in, in yeah, all um, sites of the healthcare where we can. Thank you, Ramon. Thank you. Anas, a one sentence message to the pharmacy workforce around the world? Um, while the pandemic brought out uh, the bad side to some people, uh, it brought out the high standards and the uh, great sides of uh, the healthcare force and the pharmacists. We should all work to maintain these high standards and uh, always uh, aspire to deliver the best we can. Thank you, Anas. A very powerful message there as well. Abrar? I think it's important that despite the difficulties we're going through, we should never give up. Uh, if you feel like things are getting difficult, remember what made you start and let that be a motivation for you to keep going and give it your all. Thank you, Abrar. That's fantastic. Thank so, Neil? Uh, in this kind of pandemic or any kind of industry, we pharmacists have to perform without any boundaries. We, we, we have to do whatever we can do. Uh, we have to motivate ourselves. Uh, Thank you so much, Sunil. Motivation is key, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Over to you, Mercy, with your final message. Thank you, Dahlia. So my message to we as pharmacists is when we were choosing to be pharmacists, we were choosing to fight, give that up because it was the sole reason we began. Um, yes. Maybe just to violate a little, I want to thank the Pharmaceutical Society of Uganda for the training that they have given us. Yes, thank you, Damia. You're very welcome, Mercy. Thank you for that. Sara, our final panelist, with your final message to the pharmacy workforce. Uh, so, to all the pharmacists, um, I want to uh, say that uh, we are willing and able. We have the education whatever the healthcare community needs us to do. And um, our service to the patients is saving countless lives and making thousands of differences. That's very, very touching, Sara. Thank you so much for that. These are definitely powerful messages about willingness, adaptability, um, inspiration, um, and being able, like Sara said, to give back to the health of our communities. We will wrap up today's episode. I can talk to you for another hour at least, but we do have to wrap up. I would like to sincerely thank our panelists 
and my co-moderator Katie. I would like to thank FIP organizing committee led by Dr. Lena Badr, FIP YPG and FIP the academic pharmacy section who helped us deliver this successful episode. The recording of this episode will be made available on www.fip.org slash coronavirus, a web page that includes all of our COVID-19 resources, including webinars and practice guidelines. This is also an opportunity for me to invite you to also join our new Facebook group, COVID-19 and Pharmacy where you can join a global network of pharmacy discussing the pandemic. Kindly also note that we are providing a four question survey only that will pop up at the end of the event. We kindly request that you please give your feedback so we may continue to improve our digital event offerings. But before we close, um, Katie and I want to do a final act of solidarity. We would like to ask all of our guests here uh, online and on video to show solidarity to our pharmacy heroes by creating the peace sign with our hands. Let's see if we can get this one right. And so here comes the fun, everybody, for a screenshot by our beautiful colleague, Mila, behind the scenes to support the pharmacy heroes campaign. Let's see if we can get this one right with our right hand. And here we go for the P. I hope we can all read the P correctly now. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. And good day to you all. We are so proud of you. Stay safe, everyone. Thank Goodbye. You for joining Thank everyone. you. Bye. Bye.